What is human-computer interaction, and what about it is important to our day-to-day -day lives? Hello, everyone. My name is Ansley, and I will be talking about a subset of human-computer interaction, brain-computer interfaces. My research activity explains what a brain-computer interface is and the history of it, starting from the 1920s to the present day. Human-Computer Interaction, or HCI for short, is a field of study that focuses on the design and interaction of computer technology and users. It encompasses many disciplines, like computer science, human factors engineering, and cognitive science. We will be looking into a subcategory of HCI, which is Brain-Computer Interfaces. A Brain-Computer Interface or BCI, is a way for users to interact with a computer without the user moving a muscle. It is also referred to as a mind-machine interface or direct neural interface. Let's go through the history and creation of BCI. The objective of a brain-computer interface is to develop a fast and reliable connection between a person and a computer. What this means is that the BCI serves as the bridge between a brain and the capabilities of a computer. A brain-computer interface functions by receiving, analyzing, and translating the signals from the user's brain, and by collaborating with each other, they are able to direct some external activity like opening an email or moving a robotic arm. A very important aspect of a BCI is that it has to connect to the central nervous system of the user in some way. The cool thing about BCI is that there's information going both ways. A brain-computer interface sounds similar to what neuromodulation does, but that is not the case. Neuromodulation is the alteration of nerve activity through targeted delivery of a stimulus, which is a therapy method to regulate nervous tissue. During neuromodulation, devices are implanted to connect to any part of the nervous system, which can either include drug delivery pumps or neural stimulators that go one way. There are three types of brain-computer interfaces, invasive, partially invasive, and non-invasive. A BCI is invasive if it is implanted into gray matter of the brain during neurosurgery. It has the best quality of signals because there isn't any barrier between the device and the brain. This process is very prone to scar tissue buildup, which can lead to the decreasing quality of the signal. Partially invasive BCI is when the device is implanted between the brain and the skull. It has a lower percentage of forming scar tissue. Last but not least, non-invasive BCI requires no surgery and is similar to wearable virtual reality devices. As a result of having the device outside of the user's head, the skull dampens, disperses, and blurs the signals. Let's look into the history of BCI. BCI's history started around 1924 when Hans Berger discovered electrical activity in the human brain and the development of electroencephalography, or EEG for short. EEG is electrophysiological monitoring method to record electrical activity of the brain. He was the first to use EEG to record human brain activity and made it possible to detect brain diseases. In 1977, the term BCI was created by the UCLA professor Jacques Weidel. He produced the first peer-reviewed publication for BCI. Weidel's experiment was a non-invasive EEG control in movement through a maze. Jumping forward to 2000, Duke University professor Miguel Nicolelis succeeded in building a BCI that led a monkey to reach and grasp objects on a computer screen with a robotic arm by manipulating a joystick. He hid how the joystick was used from the monkey in the beginning. Afterwards, the monkey was shown the robotic arm and it learned to control it by watching its movement. Later in 2003, Cyberkinetics, an American biotech company, commercially developed a BCI called BrainGate. BrainGate is a chip implant that became the first commercial BCI. In 2005, Matt Nagel was the first to have a BCI implanted and to control an artificial hand using the BrainGate. Matt Nagel was a 25-year-old man who has sustained a spinal cord injury which led to paralysis in all four limbs. In a duration of nine months, activity in his motor cortex region was recorded as he imagined to move his limbs, draw shapes, and play simple video games on the computer. 
So how does a brain-computer interface actually work? Through lots of trial and error, the user has to train the device over a period of time. It takes a long time because interpreting the brain signal is the hardest part of the process for the device. The system starts to learn the signal patterns of the user after some time. The signals from the user can be directed towards either robotic parts or appropriate motor control nerves to perform tasks. The PCI itself is made up of four parts, a signal capture system, a signal processing system, a pattern recognition system, and a device control system. A signal capture system is the electrodes themselves and the isolated electronic amplifiers. The signal processing system is an algorithm for the prediction of a signal. The pattern recognition system is composed of neural networks to recognize which neurons are being used to determine patterns. The device control system is the interface of the device, and that varies depending on what kind of device is being connected to the PCI. So how can brain-computer interfaces be useful? Well, some applications of it are aiding people with disabilities like Matt Nagel, pushing the development of thought-controlled devices, and maybe becoming a mainstream luxury, like changing TV channels with our minds. With such an ambitious technological development, it also comes with limitations. It can be really expensive. Like most things, the better the equipment is, the more it costs. Another issue is that there is a lack of quality sensors to provide accurate brain signals. Currently, the rate of information transformation is limited to 20 bits per minute. There is also a large learning and adapting curve in users. There is a lot of opportunities for PCI to grow, and I hope to see many more developments on it. Thank you for tuning in.